Um, let me give a summary of my arguments before I go into the substance of the presentation. The first is that I, I try to interrogate the notion of think tanks and invites us to take a broader and more nuanced perspective to it. The way think tanks are conceptualized seems quite problematic and I think we need to have a broader perspective of what is a think tank. Secondly is we should frame our discourse on Africa's development agenda around two major agendas. That is the regional and international commitments. Agenda 2063 of the African Union and Agenda 2030 of the United Nations, both of which interface very strongly and both of which will determine the trajectory of Africa's development within the next 30, 20, 15 to uh, almost 50 years. Thirdly, is to take a deeper reflection on our relationship with China, which is Sino-Africa uh, Sino relations, especially in its potentials to promote Africa's economic transformation. Here, I'm inviting us that we should go beyond the romanticization of our relationship with China. We should look at the deep, the complex dynamics of our relationship with China and how, at the end of the day, would that be able to promote Africa's socio-economic development. And I think as think tanks, that's our role. There are three reasons why our engagement with China is extremely important, and why we need to take it more seriously than ever before. The first reason is that it's projected that by 2025, China will likely be the biggest economy in the world. It will become the new global economic superpower, a position that is currently occupied by the United States. If that's the case, then the role will lead to China for every country in the world, as it is today with the United States. Secondly, is that broadly China today is the biggest investor in Africa whose investments on the continent ranges from infrastructure abroads, energy, water systems and dams, agriculture, industry, mining, and so many. So, being the biggest investor on a range of issues, we cannot ignore China. Thirdly, and quite importantly also, is that China is currently the biggest creditor to African countries, with increasing loans both concessional and non-concessional, being granted to African countries. It is estimated that between 2000 and 2014, China extended over $86 billion of commercial loans to African governments and state-owned enterprises. China currently accounts, as of 2018, about 14% of Sub-Saharan Africa total debt stock which means that African think tanks, therefore, cannot be indifferent to the role of China in Africa. We need to take it more seriously than we've ever taken it before. The subject of my intervention this morning is on the role of think tanks in Africa's development and Sino-Africa relations. A starting point of this conversation for me would be to problematize the notion of a think tank. What is a think tank? What is it really? And what are its roles in society? Literally, a think tank is a knowledge producing institution that seeks to influence policy, state, and society towards a particular course of action. Its focus is usually policy relevant research and advocacy in facilitating socioeconomic and political development at the national, regional, and the global level. The liberal discourse on think tanks tend to focus on non-governmental institutions that engage in policy research and advocacy. What James Milan calls public policy research analysis and engagement organizations. They are considered to be non-profit, independent, and mostly rely 
on mostly do not rely on government sources of funding, which tends to assure their autonomy. They also have space and flexibility to produce quick policy briefs, provide speedy policy advice, and swiftly engage in burning national, regional, and global issues. John Boa qualifies them as influence peddlers who mobilize expertise and ideas to influence the policy-making process. This notion of a think tank from where I stand is rather limited and its basic assumptions are quite problematic. For example, the notion of financial autonomy on which the argument of independence is constructed for the liberal concept think tanks is quite questionable. Whether government or donor funding, the sources of funding are mostly external to those institutions. And in many cases, there are interests, expectations, and results expected from those funding sources. Indeed, state funding within a constitutional order is appropriate for think tanks, where the legitimacy and contribution of knowledge to social advancement is apparent. Second, social research and analysis although could be clearly evidence-based and scientific, but they are underpinned by clear normative values, which provide guiding principles and direction for such research. Those ideas and actions are not value-free, and those norms can be contested, contradictory, or aligned with certain social forces or interests in society. Those objectivity, which we tend to claim we project, is oftentimes a relative concept. My notion of a think tank, therefore, is more encompassing and broader. It includes one, universities and research institutions, which are the epic centers of knowledge production, policy advocacy, and sometimes debate and dissent. Two, non-governmental research and policy advocacy institutions, which in the liberal conception is called a think tank. Three, regional and international policy knowledge centers, including my own institution, that produce knowledge which seeks to shape regional and global policy dynamics and undertake advocacy on key development issues like illicit financial flows, regional integration, trade, migration, climate change, etc. Of course, there are varied forms of think tanks with different institutional setups, capacity, and resources and also exist at different levels. What is the context in which think tanks thrive, and what are the resources that they need to function? The congenial environment that accommodates dissent, critique, and constructive engagement with the state and other interests in society is essential for think tanks to operate successfully. Adequate financial support, which ap appreciates the contributions of think tanks to development, is also very important. Both state and non-state resources are permissible so long as they are not string-tied, hidden agenda-driven, or with conditionality, beyond delivery on set goals and targets. Third, a system that affords access to points of power and pressure by knowledge-based institutions. In other words, there must be good linkages between the knowledge and policy communities. Four key resources are central to the success of think tanks as Boa identifies. These are good ideas based on strong intellectual capacity. So you cannot have a think tank that doesn't have a researcher. You cannot have a think tank that doesn't have intellectuals. It's not a think tank. So if you have a one briefcase person think tank, it's not a think tank. It's simply not a think tank. And we've got many of that. So we need to be very critical of the notion of what we call a think tank. A think tank must have good ideas based on strong intellectual capacity, a coalition of actors to support those ideas, the institutional capacity to nurture and shepherd those ideas in a dynamic context, and the ability to seize the moment when the timing is right and correct. Given the foregoing, what then is the role of think tanks in Africa's development? Apart from analyzing, critiquing, and promoting alternative policy options and strategic directions for the continent, African think tanks should be agenda setters that provide navigational tools for the key development priorities of the continent. The two main development frameworks in Africa of a regional and global nature are Agenda 2063 of the African Union 
and Agenda 2030, the SDGs of the United Nations. African countries have signed on to both development agendas and both interface very well. Delivery one is also delivering the other. Hence, the AU and ECA have worked closely together in creating a framework of interface between Agenda 2063 and Agenda 2030. The goal of Agenda 2063 is to create an integrated, prosperous, peaceful, democratic and developed continent driven by its own citizens and representing a dynamic force in the international arena. The 10-year implementation plan provides concrete anchor on the pathway towards realizing it. The key aspirations of the agenda, the goals and priority areas are major issues which African think tanks need to, need to critically engage. Perhaps also to say that the current reforms going on in the African Union is what should interest us as African think tanks. What are the key policy options for Africa in creating a prosperous continent based on inclusive growth and sustainable development? How can the target of 7% GDP growth rate be realized, which is contained in the 10-year implementation plan of Agenda 2063? How can total agricultural factor productivity be doubled by 2023, which is a major one of the objectives of the 10 Action Plan? How, we, how can we transform our blue economy resources to accelerate production, promote eco-friendly coastal tourism, and evolve marine biotechnology products? These are some of the key elements of Agenda 2063, which African think tanks, to be relevant, can certainly not ignore. Regional integration, peace and security are also central in realizing the dreams of Agenda 2063. Promoting inter africa trade is a vital means through which Africa will negotiate itself out of poverty. The African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement constitutes the single most important initiative in recent times in promoting inter africa trade. Launched and signed in Kigali, Rwanda by over 40 African countries, countries it has since secured enough number of ratifications to go into effect. And by March, uh, May 30th this year, it will go into effect. The CFTA will, will create the biggest trade bloc with, over, with about 1.29 billion people with estimated combined GDP of about $2.5 trillion. African think tanks cannot ignore this initiative. African think tanks Need, need to be in the lead in thinking through, the, thinking through the opportunities, challenges, constraints, and limitations, including the possible influence of global forces and dynamics on the African continental free trade area, and also the risks associated with it. Those think tanks also need to be cross country, also need to do cross country and regional analysis of potential impact on different countries and how we need to ensure a win win situation for all countries, small medium and big. The issue of migration is another policy area that African think tanks cannot be indifferent to. The, go the gory images displayed on global television networks convey a sordid and scary picture and create a distorted narrative of the migration story. Yet the facts of migration, the facts of global migration are disconnected from the media sensationalism that we see on our television, televisions. This has implications for branding Africa. It creates a negative, a somewhat negative image of a land of hunger and deprivation where there are no economic opportunities and where investments could be risky. But nothing, nothing can be further from the truth. The facts are that fresh intra-Africa migration is far more than extra African migration. People move more on this continent than they move outside this continent. But a lot of people don't know that. They only see the images of sinking ships and sinking boats, sinking boats, and the media glitz on it makes it so big as if it's only Africans who are moving. And Africans moving within Africa is far more, far, far more than Africans moving outside. And I'll provide some of the statistics. Second, migration data from the Global Migration Report 2017 issued by the Department of Economic and Social Affairs of the United Nations 
called UNDESA, indicates that Africa constitutes 14.1% of international migrants. 14.1%. Asia constitutes 41%. Europe constitutes 23.7%, while the Oceania has the lowest, 0.7%. The report further notes, and I quote, Considering each region's relative share in the world population, international migrants from Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean Oceania, The report for that notes, and I quote, considering each region's relative share in the world population, international migrants from Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and Oceania, we are overrepresented. Overrepresented. While international migrants of Asia, North America, and Africa, we are underrepresented. Underrepresented in relation to population this time around. Underscoring the positive value of migration, the report concludes, when supported by, and I quote, when supported by appropriate policies, migration can contribute to inclusive and sustainable economic growth and development in both home and host communities. African think tanks need to create alternative narratives on the African migration story and underscore the positive impacts of Africa's migration on global development. We need to create an alternative narrative because the images we see on television is, a, is an image of an hopeless continent. That's what we see, but it's not true. Other people are moving from other parts of the world. Africa's percentage of international migration is very, very low compared to other you know, regions of the world. A final critical issue to Africa's development agenda is about engendering peace and security, specifically on how do we silence the guns by 2020. <coughs> Peace and security constitute the bedrock of development. What should African countries, especially the country really wants to do to arrest the situation? Is the introduction of electoral democracy enough? How do we arrest the free flow of arms, crimes, violence, and terrorism that characterize the Sahel region? These are some of the questions we as African think tanks need to address. On China-Africa relations and the role of think tanks, there is need for deeper reflections than what we are currently doing. China-Africa relations is rooted more on strong historical ties, fraternal solidarity, and the logic of South-South cooperation. This is good and has produced several advantages for the continent, including trade diversification that headed the commodity boom of the 90s and early uh, 2000s, which likely accounts for the Africa rising narrative and the infusion by China of massive capital into Africa, especially the infrastructure which has enhanced economic activities. However, we need to analyze the complex dynamics of this relationship and unravel its nuances in understanding what the medium and long-term implications and benefits could be, especially for Africa's economic transformation. At a strategic level, which is a point that a lot of colleagues have talked about, does Africa have a China strategy or policy? the same way China has an Africa strategy. If Africa were to have a strategy, what will it look like? And what will be its content? If today we are supposed to be saying we want to track, you know, design a China strategy for Africa, what will it look like? What will be the content of that strategy? I think this is something that African think tanks will be looking at. What are Africa's strategic objectives in our engagement with China? And how would the relationship have transformative effects on African economies to leapfrog Africa from the third to the second, if not to the first world? The infrastructure we've emphasized is good, but infrastructure is not enough to promote economic transformation. It's not enough. It's just a part of the variables that we need to put in place. In promoting Africa's economic transformation, Issues of technological content and transfer, <coughs> skills development, value addition and beneficiation, especially for agricultural mineral resources, and the growth of small and medium scale enterprises will be very key and extremely essential. How does the relationship with China promote those key economic variables? 
and what are the implications of Af China's Africa's trade relations with China for industrialization and the growth of our SMEs. These issues cannot be taken for granted and require thorough interrogation by African think tanks and development practitioners. They require critical analysis in order to generate robust but useful discussion and policy options for our policymakers. China's economic miracle and the lessons learned provide us equally important resources for development as much as the tangible material support and trade relations with China. How did China transform itself dramatically in less than five decades? What did China do differently? How did it manage its industrialization process? What were the catalysts and game changers for China in that process? What was the nature of China's multilateral engagement as it navigates the tortuous terrain of industrialization and economic transformation? What are some of the lessons African countries can learn from this process? While we cannot replicate the experience of China, but we certainly can learn, but we, but, but we can learn from, from it. African think tanks will be very key to that learning process of the experience of China. I thank you for your kind attention.